tonight, God. And I praise you for that. Pray that everything that goes from this point forward be in your will and in your way, God. In your name I pray. Amen. You the kids, you can be dismissed, and adults, you can be seated. We know that the doubt is the opposite of faith, and we don't want to admit that maybe our faith is being shaken. We don't want to admit that maybe we're going through something that seems too hard for us. Um, and these doubts come in a variety of forms. But maybe we don't believe that, that God can heal us because we've dealt with the same physical issue for so long. So at some point, maybe we just stop praying for healing, and now we just pray for God to give us something else. Maybe we just ask for peace. But it's those little things. It's just... It's those tiny bits of doubt that creep in, and if they're not addressed, they become bigger issues. Um, doubt can look like thinking that God can't work a miracle in our relationships because maybe our significant other is so stubborn or so hard-headed that they're never going to change. And so we stop praying for them. We stop praying with them. And so it's, it's the second and third order effects that end up being the things that become problems. And it all became from that seed of doubt, that, that little tiny thought or feeling that you had that you never addressed, you never thought about. But I, I want to address these because we don't like to talk about them. So if we talk about them, maybe we can kind of get it out in the open. So I'm going to talk about doubt, but I also want to show you guys some biblical examples on how Jesus handled doubt um, because it's, it's very, very encouraging. And then I also want to talk to you about what I think the bigger problem is. But before we dig into God's word, I'd just like to pray. God, we just thank you for this time and coming to come together, um, learn together something that you have for us. God, we thank you that your word is alive and applicable even today. God, I pray you open our hearts to hear something, to, to feel something, God, that, that moves us to, to change in a way that's more positive, God, and a way that we can share with others around us. We just thank you for this time, God, and use it as yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I actually I did a smaller lesson on doubt with a small group months and months ago, and so I already kind of had the, the idea, I like the topic, I really like these two examples, but what really, really kind of set it for me was here a few weeks back, um, I was at a funeral, there's a soldier of ours who, his, uh, his wife passed away very young, she was pregnant with twins, they died, Aww. and yes, yes, exactly, and so obviously the funeral was very, very sad, she was a young one, I think in her early 30s. She left behind a husband and a seven or eight-year-old daughter. It's a tough situation. But as I listened to the preacher, all I could think about is he's not addressing any of the feelings that I know that the people who are sitting there today are feeling. Because I know God. I have a good relation with God. And I, I, I can ask those same questions. And so I remember just thinking, like, why are we not addressing? We know, we know that people are questioning God. How could God let this happen? How could God allow this thing? And again, that, that comes from just not knowing, that, that little bit of doubt. A little bit of doubt. How could a good, loving God allow something like this to happen? And there's never a great answer um, to give somebody when they're dealing with this. Um, trying to explain um, maybe why he, they feel like they did, he didn't answer their prayers. And that's a tough place to be. And I just wanted to tell them that it's, it's okay to feel that way. As long as you don't stay that way. 
Uh, those feelings are normal. And what happens is when, when you think that you're not supposed to feel that way, then you begin attacking yourself. You can pile all these other things on yourself. But again, it all started from that seed of doubt. I think it would be great to say that we never doubt. I would love to stand before you guys and say that my entire life, I've just always known that God is always going to deliver. And he has always delivered, but I didn't always feel like it. And, and I know the right answer. All of you here have probably heard the right answer. I know that God says he's always going to be there. But when I don't feel that peace that I've been praying for, that doubt begins to set in. When, when, the, when the, the, the things that you know don't align with the things that you feel, you've got to decide, what am I going to go with? What am I going to follow? Well, oftentimes we find ourselves following that feeling. Because um, the feeling's powerful, and it's tangible, and, and it hurts. And I, again, I just want to encourage you, it's, it's okay to ask those questions. But again, uh, you're, not, you're not alone. You're not alone in that feeling. Everybody goes through these these ebbs and flows. The Christian walk is not easy. Um, but don't put yourself down because you feel it. Certainly don't allow it to have you remove yourself from the, the church, remove yourself from the uh, fellowship of other believers, just because you think that you're not worthy to do it. So the first, the first point uh, we're going to look at is just simply, we're all susceptible to doubt. Every single one of us, no matter whether you're 80 years old or 8 years old, we're all susceptible to it. And it's because we're in this world, we're in this world that everything around us is fighting against our spirit. So I want to look at two examples because I don't, I don't want to just show you verses that are supposed to uplift you, supposed to make you feel good. I want to show you situations, show you how Jesus handled these situations, and hopefully use those as, as a point of encouragement. So if you're reading along, then we're going to use the two examples. We've got John the Baptist, and we got Thomas, and we're going to be working in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 18, and in John chapter 20, starting in verse 19, we're going to bounce back and forth between the two, so if you just want to mark those. And they will be on the screen then. But our first example is going to be Thomas. Thomas has been nicknamed Doubting Thomas, so it seemed only proper that we, we start with the guy who stuck with this nickname. But at this point in the story, Jesus has been crucified. He has, he has left the tomb. He has appeared to some of the disciples. At this point, Thomas had not seen it. So in John chapter 20, it says, uh, remember, the disciples were told by Jesus to wait, right? To wait in Jerusalem until they were filled with the Spirit, until the Spirit descended on them. So they're actually waiting. And here in verse 18, it says, uh, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, they showed him his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So I just want to pause there for a moment. He's saying, I will not believe. I, I have to see it. Even though he, you imagine he's, he's walked with these people for a long time. He trusts these other disciples. But he still can't quite feel right about it until he's seen it for himself. And I think a lot of times that might be us. A lot of times that might be someone you're trying to share with. And they just feel like they have to see it. But with Thomas, I think we should be encouraged. Because it reminds us that no matter how close you've walked with God, there is the potential to fall into doubt, to worry, and to not believe. This Thomas had seen many miracles. Right? He had walked alongside Jesus. He had been privy to intimate teachings from Jesus that the crowds, the multitudes, did not get. He had been empowered by Jesus at one point that all the disciples would go out and they cast out demons and they healed people in Christ's name. Thomas, this is the same Thomas who now we're seeing here, he, he, he doesn't believe that, that Christ. Because at this point, others had been raised from the dead. Prophets had raised people. 
Jesus had raised people from the dead. But nobody had raised themselves. So he didn't have, there's no precedent for him to believe. Not in the same way that we have it. Jesus had done it. So if it happened again, if it was Jesus, we would believe it. But we, at least we have that. But Thomas didn't. And because of this, uh, this scene or this interaction, he's been, like I said, given this nickname, Thomas the Doubter, Doubting Thomas. But this saying Thomas in John chapter 11 is, is, is totally, it doesn't even sound like a doubt. Because in John chapter 11, uh, Lazarus had died. And Jesus wanted to go to Bethany because he, he knew that he needed to raise from the dead. He knew God needed to be glorified in the situation. But the disciples knew that the last time they were there, they, they, the Pharisees, and they tried to stone them. And so they were worried for their lives. They were like, hey, we don't need to go. This is a bad idea. They're trying to convince Jesus not to go. And Thomas says this. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go that we may die with them. This same Thomas was ready to go die. He was ready to die alongside his master. And fast forward, and, and after all these events, he still has this moment of doubt. So, so what, what's the difference? I always, I always think about this. There's, I don't know if you've listened to Hamilton the musical or seen it, but there's a line in it that I always think about when I talk about Thomas. And I always think about it with a Christian wall. Um, but then in the, in the musical, there's a line. It says, dying is easy. Living is harder. Dying is easy. Living is harder. See, for Thomas, it makes sense. If you just die with him, he said many times, die for me, right? And you'll, you'll live with me forever. So the dying a martyr death, I mean, you, you get to heaven. Like, how could Jesus then, if you literally physically died for him? You think you'd be good. But living... Every single day, dying to yourself daily, dying to your fleshy desires, dying to your selfish interests, that, that, that living a life out loud for Christ, that's, that's much more difficult. All right, it takes a lot more discipline. You're going to go through a lot more. Each of these disciples would experience it one way or the other. They, they lived hard lives, and dying maybe at this point would have felt easier. Mm -hmm. So even though he's ready to die, and that might be the easy way out. But this is the same Thomas that's ready to die and doubts later. This is a guy who walked with Jesus and doubted. All right, so if you doubted, understand that you were, you were in the company of people who physically got to walk alongside Jesus. For John the Baptist, I think we can draw even more encouragement. At this point, John the Baptist had been arrested. He's locked in jail. Uh, he knows that uh, Herodias or Herodias wants him killed. He's in as rough a circumstance as one can get, and he had told Herod the truth of Herod's sin, and that didn't typically work out for people who did that, okay? And so they want him dead, and he's in here, and it's not good conditions. But while Angelic hears word of some of the miracles that Jesus is performing, so he sends some messengers to see Jesus. We read here, Luke chapter 7. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? That the, the, weight, the weight of that question, it's, it's more than just asking. This is, again, John the Baptist is no joke. This is a guy who, unique in Scripture, was filled with the Holy Spirit inside the womb. He was set apart from the beginning of his life to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. And he did that. He, he was such an outcast that they, they thought he was wild. He, he didn't fit in. Right? He wasn't part of the world. The only thing he was focused on was that mission. He was baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before it was the thing. Before he really even understood what that meant. This is the same John the Baptist that would, would hold our Savior and baptize him. And, and, and saw the, the Spirit to sound him like a dove. He, he, he heard the voice from heaven say, this is my son in whom I will please. This John, now at some point, he can't look past this circumstance. At some point he's thinking, well, I've, I've done everything I can and now I'm worried. Even for a moment. Now I'm wondering. Just that moment of a thought. To the point that 
from jail. He's like, I'm going to send messengers. I've got, I've got to handle this. I've got to figure this out. So you can imagine what he's going through. You can imagine what he felt having committed his whole life to a cause that now here, right before the end of it, there's just that momentary flash of the feeling. So if this John doubted, who are we to think that we never will? We weren't filled with the Spirit from the inside the woman. We weren't. We, didn't, we weren't set apart in the same way. That we are all set apart in our different ways. But I'm saying, in Scripture, if we look, John the Baptist had a very, very unique, and, and the parallel, they parallel his birth in the Bible to Jesus. That's, that's important. This is an important figure in the Bible. So if he doubted, I guarantee you, me and you, we're going we're gonna to run into those moments. So we have to choose how we handle those moments. Thankfully, Jesus, and we'll see in these examples, he, he deals gently with doubt. Okay? That's the second point. He deals gently with doubt. He, he probably deals with doubt better than we deal with doubt. When someone doubts you, what do you typically do? You get mad. You get angry. But you sometimes get focused. Okay? But I want to look at how Jesus deals with doubt. So we're going to go back um, and look at the, the, the situation with Thomas. So... Jesus is coming. Thomas says, uh, until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. So it says a week later. It doesn't say the next day. It doesn't say immediately after Thomas doubted. It says a week later. His disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. And Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And later, Matt talked about it on, on Sunday, uh, when Peter is fishing. Thomas is in that group of them who are fishing. And when Jesus sees them, he calls them friends. So even after this, the last Interaction we see between Jesus and Thomas is Jesus responding to Thomas' doubt. We see Jesus counting him among his friends. Okay, he didn't reprimand him. He didn't punish him. He didn't ignore him. He didn't cast him aside. He didn't give up on Thomas. But he did say that there's a better way. It doesn't mean that he doesn't understand what, he, what Thomas is going through, but he just says there's a better way. Right? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have. with John the Baptist. Go back to Luke. Immediately after the messengers came and asked the questions, in verse 20, verse 21, it says, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. We look at this, and again, you, you can't really ignore the parallels. He, he answers specifically to what he felt John needed to know. See, with John, Jesus isn't just doing whatever he wants. He's just not making a, a highlight reel here. He's answering specifically to what the scripture has prophesied that the Messiah would look like. Because, see, John, probably the reason he doubted is because the way Jesus lived his life in ministry didn't look anything like John was expecting. And that's what created the doubt. I don't doubt that he believed that the miracles were happening. I doubt that at some point it didn't look the way he expected it. And that's why he was concerned. And so Jesus, when he's doing this, he's being very, very specific for John. He knows John knows these specific things. And that's why he did that. And then even after. After John's messengers left. Jesus began to speak to the crowd. About John. Now, this is what the Savior thinks of John. He says what did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No those who wear expensive clothes. And indulge in luxury or in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. 
I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. For a guy who just doubted, literally just doubted, that is a heck of an endorsement. Mm -hmm. Okay? What a life lived that the king of glory would say that about you. That, that um, of all those born of women, no one is greater than John. But even still, John had a moment where his circumstances overcame him, his feelings, his doubt, his worry finally crept through him and became an action. If you look at both these instances, we see that Jesus responds to very specific doubts, questions. I think in my sermon about Gideon, if you're there, I think I said we serve a specific God about 20 or 30 times. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's an important thing. Right? He handled John very specifically and very differently than he handled Thomas. And he's going to handle your doubt very specifically. But it's going to be specific to you. See, for Thomas, Jesus wasn't there when, when Thomas said, I need, to, I need to touch his hand. I need to feel his side. Thomas wasn't there, but Jesus knew. And so as soon as Jesus saw him, he said, I'm going to address this. And he did. Jesus is saying, trust what you see in feel. But then for John, again, he performed those, those very specific miracles in the sight of those messengers. He told them, go tell John what they saw. Right? Again, all these signs, knowing that John will know them because of his commitment to one of the scriptures. Signs that he knows in John's heart will reassure John. All right? Essentially telling John to trust what he has read and heard. Trust what you know. Trust, I mean, like I said, go think about all these experiences. Let that weigh over you more than this moment of feeling in your head. And I think maybe that's why we don't feel God answering us sometimes. Is maybe we're not as familiar with the word as we need to be to see the, the obvious signs right in front of us. In both instances, we see that while he knows gently, right? He doesn't punish him, he doesn't reprimand him, he doesn't make them feel worthless. But he does insist that there's a better way. Right, he concluded both interactions with those men by pointing to that better alternative. Right, blessed is anyone who's not stumbled on account of me. Blessed are those who have not seen and believed. So we see here that Jesus is not saying it's good to doubt. He just understands. He gets it. Because when he came, he was just as human as us. So he had to overcome all of these things. We, we talk about how much time um, Jesus spent with sinners how much time he did. But you know, he spent a whole lot more time alone with God praying, developing that relationship. And so that is how he was able to overcome the way that we have it, because we're not, we're not as committed. There's a distinction, I believe, between disbelief and unbelief. Right? I believe disbelief can turn to doubt, and that's why I say it. But there's a difference between disbelief and unbelief. See, unbelief is defiant. Unbelief is not tolerated. Jesus is very straightforward about unbelief. But disbelief is a little bit different. Disbelief might be something like, how could God love me when I feel so in love with him? Disbelief might be like, I've never experienced this miracle, so how could it happen to me? Or, or, or why, why would God want anything to do? Why would he want to use me? I don't have any status. That could be disbelief. Because it just, our brains don't comprehend that kind of love, that kind of goodness. But as, as long as, and that disbelief comes from a limited understanding, which I believe is why Jesus handles it so gently. Because he gets that at this time we don't have full understanding. We won't get it all. So this natural disbelief, that's a thing that's going to be common to us that isn't to, um, to God. Who does understand and know all things, can see the bigger picture. I think as believers, certainly as, as a church body, we should model Jesus. And that's how we should handle people who have doubt, people who are dealing with sin. It's not to try to punish them into submission. It's to show them the, the same grace that we've received. That's going to be what wins people. I don't, I've never talked to anybody that was like, wow, the threat of hell is why I'm saved. It was, no, I experienced some, some love so magnificent in my life that I just can't ignore it. Whether in the form of doubting whether God exists, 
Or if we doubt his power in our lives, or if we doubt that he is who he says he is, doubt is a natural thing, but doubt is not a disqualifier. See, Satan would like to think, or like you to think, that because you doubted God, because maybe you doubted whether he was working for you, whether he was even there at all, that, that you have somehow disqualified yourself from the love of the Lord. But we see in, in those men that fall into those doubts that this is not how Jesus works. It's just not the case. So if we look at these two examples, I believe we come to a simple but I think a very powerful conclusion, right? We should not be proud of our doubt, but we should know that Jesus understands. And he's willing to answer it specifically if you're willing to bring it to him. Jesus doesn't give up on us, but the enemy doesn't want you to think this. From the very beginning, Satan wants you to feel shame. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve bit of the apple, one of the first things they did was cover themselves. They, they felt their nakedness for the first time. And they hid from the Lord. So while God was seeking them out, trying to reconcile with them, trying to have a relationship with them, they, in their shame, were hiding. They were creating a separation. They were moving away because of their shame. And Satan was the same thing for you. He's not doing anything new. He wants you to feel so ashamed that you don't go before the Lord in repentance. He wants you to feel so ashamed that you don't live a life out loud for Christ. He knows that if you repent, you're going to feel forgiveness and strength and power. He knows if you're living your life boldly for Christ, that you're going to change the people around you. And so if he can get you out of the fight by letting you take yourself out because you feel some type of way, you feel shame, you feel guilty. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying feel good about sin, right? The Holy Spirit will convict you, and you're not going to feel good about what you're doing. But there's a difference in that, that conviction and, and, and wallowing in shame. And Satan is using your shame as a weapon against you and those around you. If he can convince you to be quiet because you don't think you're worthy to talk, somebody's not going to hear the thing that they need to hear. First Corinthians 9, Paul talks about, I became all things to all men so that by any means I can win some. But at the same time he says that he had to whip his body and to condition, make his body a slave so that after he got done preaching he would then be disqualified himself. So even Paul's like, look, I know that as a great of a teacher as I am, as sure as I am that I'm doing the right thing in the sight of God, I, my ministry is all for him. I'm not taking that to talk. I'm not doing it for me. But even he realized that, hey, I have a tendency to not necessarily do the right thing or not to feel the right way. So I've got to fight that every day with discipline. So is that is that you? Right? Are you hiding in your shame? Maybe it isn't doubt. Maybe you just haven't made God your priority. Maybe you just haven't lived, not necessarily to the perfect standard of Christ, but maybe not even to the best of your own ability. Maybe you can, you can, can continue to make choices that aren't reflecting the heart that you, that you have for Christ. Regardless of what it is, I want you to know that Jesus is that merciful. Jesus is that gracious, that he understands that he's going to forgive you. But the task for you is you have to bring it to him. You have to let him deal with it. Because if you try to hold on to it, all you're doing is creating more problems for yourself. When you're reminded of your sin, that's not God. Because if you've come to God with a repentant heart and you've truly been forgiven, God's wiped your slate clean. He's not going to continue reminding you about it. So that's Satan. And if you're reminding others about their sin, me and my dad always joke, you're just subcontracting work out for Satan. Okay, you're just doing his job. When uh, you're reminded of that momentary doubt, that's not God. Just like God asked Adam and Eve, who told you that when they said they were naked? He, he's not in the business of making people feel shame. He wants them to feel his love. He wants them to understand that more than our happiness, he wants our holiness. He wants us to be righteous because that's all he knows. But he's not going to make you feel ashamed. He's not going to add weight to the burden that already is heavy enough. 
But when you allow yourself to stay ashamed of what you've done in the past, you're essentially picking up and holding chains that God has already broken for you. They're not attached to anything. They're just extra weight you're holding on to. You're carrying it for nothing. And it's already tough enough to fight for your faith in the midst of all of your struggles and doubt, but it's only made worse when you pile guilt and shame on top of it. You will eventually be smothered. So you have to handle your doubt up front and not allow yourself to hide in shame and prolong that battle. Because the longer you do, the, the greater the separation you create between you and God. You know, you're hiding. You're trying to cover yourself up. And he's just seeking you out. He's just trying to say, hey, what's going on? So, again, I think that it's very, very simple. Obviously, these are very loaded bullet points, right? Because the first thing we need is we need to recognize our moments of doubt, which sometimes you feel that conviction. You know, hey, I've done something wrong. I need to work on this. I need to identify it. But sometimes maybe it's not. But, but to recognize it, you've got to hear what God says about the issue. You've got to be reading the Bible for yourself, experience what God is saying. Don't just rely on a preacher on Sunday morning and a teacher on Wednesday night to give you everything you need. Dig into the Word, and you'll begin to recognize aspects of your life that aren't the way God would have them. And again, just like John, there were some specific signs, things that were in Scripture that pointed to who Jesus was. Maybe there's some reassurance. Maybe there's something that when you read it, you're like, wow, this is exactly what I'm dealing with. That's God saying, hey, look, I... I have the answer. Just come to me and ask. We have to understand that those moments don't disqualify us from the grace that God gives. Right? We've all done something horrible. Regardless, as good of a life we live, we're going to stand before a perfect and righteous God. And if not for Jesus, we would look dirty either way. Right? When, when Jesus said, no, there's no man greater than John, but the least in heaven is greater than him. He's just showing you, look, there's not, there's not a path through works that gets to heaven. So we have to understand that, that those moments don't disqualify us. Let's not let the enemy convince us and get us out of the fight because we think that we don't deserve it anymore, that we've lost it for ourselves. Do not hide in shame, but accept the grace and forgiveness that comes with repentance. And if you're spending your time like afraid to go to God, afraid to tell him what you're going through, you're wasting your time. Go before God and say, God, I messed up. I had this moment. Model John the Baptist, right? So in his moment of doubt, his toughest circumstance, his biggest challenge, he immediately sought Jesus out to set himself right. It's not selfish to ask God for a specific answer. Right? In the Bible, Gideon specifically tells an angel, like he sees this guy, and he tells him exactly what he needs. Hey, God, I need you to do this specific thing so I know that it's you. God is gracious enough to answer. But you've got to interact with him to get that. To have that experience, you've got to be spending time with God and not hiding in your shame. So tonight our prayer is simply that God will empower you to quit walking in shame, that you step out of that and into the grace that, that he so freely gives. Into that best alternative. Where even when you doubt, you immediately seek to reconcile with him just like he did in the garden for us. Mm -hmm. John, who Jesus said, none was born by a woman was better. He understood, right? And in his doubt, he reached out to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I need you to silence my doubt. And then we can do the same. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that you deal with us gently. So much more gracious are you than we deserve, God. We thank you that you, you paid the price for us, that we can stand before a holy God, unblemished God. We thank you for the lessons that you show us. We just thank you for your mercy and all that you do for us, God. God, I pray that you keep us. I pray that you grow us. And we pray that you help us be tools to grow your kingdom and all that we do in this church. Let's ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. <laughs> now, I think one of the things that, that hurt us the most is the idea that, that we can't believe that even when we don't see him, he's working. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part for us. Is we don't see things moving, so we assume that nothing's happening. 
when, if you look at the Bible, you look at the story of Elisha, and he opens his eyes, and he sees all these people fighting, and he sees all these, these angels that are working, that there's another dimension that's going on that you're not aware of. And it's happening behind the veil. And if we can ever trust that the Lord is working on something behind the veil, eventually, I've seen it in my own life, the veil drops and it's complete. And there's the whole thing that he's been working on the whole time that he didn't do in just a minute. He's actually been working over time for me on my behalf. Then I can go, you know what, I can trust him. You know, I may not, I may not, I may have thought I was by myself, I may have thought nothing was going on, but you know what, I can trust him. And then we get something in that's completely done and completely finished from the Lord and he hands it to us complete. He doesn't hand it to us in pieces. So thanks for that. Uh, if you are uh, dismissed tonight, uh, nothing really left for me, but turn around and bring someone near you and tell them you did a great job. I appreciate you teaching tonight. And, uh, and you can go off from here.